I'm Kevin Guthrie, and I'm, uh, I was the co-founder of JSTOR, and I'm the president of Ithaca. Uh, I've been uh, working in the education and technology space since 1995 when we, uh, when we started JSTOR. And, um, you know, we start, we're a not-for-profit organization. We were started uh, uh, to actually to save shelf space at libraries was the original idea, that uh, long runs of academic journals were filling up the shelf space at many, many libraries. And Bill Bowen, who, who was the president of the Mellon Foundation at the time and previously the president of Princeton, uh, was the one who had the idea. He's an economist and was on the board of actually Denison. And uh, Denison was doing a big addition to their library. And, um, and he was like, do we really need to build all this space for all these old old journals? Um, and at the time, you know, we weren't connected by the web. It was 1995, so his idea was really to try to just you know reduce space, like put the put the content onto CD-ROMs and have them be you know like Encarta, if you remember the uh, the Microsoft Encyclopedia. And um, so the idea was to save save, save space, and then. Um, you know, we got started as a as a grant project at the University of Michigan, um, and demonstrated the the concept that you could digitize this content and do OCR on the on the uh, images to create text that could be searchable, that would be valuable, and at the same time we could reduce the costs of of shelf space. So we were started as a not for profit, really, you know, to act as kind of a library in the cloud. Uh, for uh, for libraries and felt like we needed to be a not for profit to be able to stand in that position, and um, and also to encourage publishers to make their content available, license the content for this kind of uh, preservation based perpetual access. So so we're a not for profit from the very beginning. I mean, really with a broad mission to serve education, um, but with the specific goal of of creating this um, this what became a database of of the. Uh, core academic journals in the humanities and social sciences, reaching all the way back to their first volume and first issue. So, you know, we did that in the, as I said, in the, in the sort of mid nineties, right before, you know, the beginning of, of Google and all that, we kind of were swept up in the wave uh, when that, when that all took off. So how long, you know, initially you were supported by grants, but now you're, you know, kind of a thriving organization on your own. Um, how long did that process take? Yeah, so we, we, we started from the very beginning as um, we said we need to create a sustainable service. I mean, even though the Mellon Foundation was was supporting us and Bill Bowen was was behind it, he was like, we've got to create a sustainable service. We've got to figure out a model that will allow us to continue to exist long beyond, you know, foundation grant funding. So, you know, we, we, we first launched in 1997, and we had two components to our fee structure. One was a one-time a uh, component that would help us to develop a reserve so that we could preserve the content for the long run. So we wanted to create a kind of endowment and and the funds from that endowment would allow us to keep sustaining the the, uh, the actual database, the actual content for the long run. And then this concept of a subscription for annual access fees that would uh, that cover the cost of access over time. So, you know, in the early days, we kind of had a we, we brought in a fair amount of capital from the one-time payments, but we didn't have very much annual access fees. So it took us quite a while uh, to generate the annual fees. And the, the key for us was um, that we we launched uh, multiple collections. So we licensed the collections one by one. So, you know, I would say it probably took us, you know, four or five years before we had uh, this, you know, sort of we were, we, we had a kind of sustainable level of revenue to cover our, our expense, our expenses. Uh, we did develop a, a little bit of capital at that time that would allow us to invest in more content. And we actually had, that was where our, most of our grant funding came in the early days was, uh, to help us digitize content that we would include on the platform. And that was really valuable because we didn't have to pay the investment cost, the capital cost of generating the content. We just had to recapture the uh, cost of the annual cost of that. And so that was what allowed us to get up to a sustainable level. Um, as I said, it was probably it was probably four or five years before we were we were uh, we were covering our costs with our, our our annual revenue. So can you talk uh, or just you know kind of briefly like how big are you and kind of what is the reach of the organization like? How many libraries are you serving? And you know, yeah. Uh, so, so we we um uh, uh, JSTOR is now a part of Ithaca, and Ithaca is uh, 
is an organization with its with the mission to serve education worldwide and to make education more accessible, you know, all over the all over the globe. One of the services at JSTOR, another of our services is Portico, which is a long-term uh, archive and preservation of uh, of of born electronic and electronic content. And then um, Ithaca SNR, which does uh, consulting and strategic research in the same areas, you know, of education. Partic with a particular emphasis on on access and completion uh, to higher education for uh, underrepresented groups, uh, low socioeconomic status folks, et cetera. So um, we uh, we we do the work in all these areas, and and are approximately about a hundred million dollars of revenue when you combine everything together uh, per year. Um, you know that's been kind of steady growth over over the nearly thirty years of our existence. It's not been you know super uh, high growth, but just pretty steady growth throughout. Um, there are about, uh, I think we're close to 13,000 institutions that license JSTOR um, as library licenses. That includes um, uh, several thousand that are what we call uh, developing nation and access initiative institutions, meaning uh, they either get free access or extremely low uh, discounted access. Uh, there are quite a number that get free access, like in Africa and, the, you know, in, in, in Asia as well, and uh, South America. And we, we also have um, uh, about 3,000 secondary schools that license uh, JSTOR at this point. Um, there are uh, approximately 2,000 publishers, um, uh, 800 publishers and 2,000, 2,500 journals, I think is about the number. So um, mainly in the social sciences and humanities, again, uh, less in the uh, STM fields. Uh, we have natural sciences and such. So, you know, it's, it, JSTOR has, has pretty, pretty um, uh, broad coverage and reach uh, in the humanities and in the human, humanistic social sciences. Uh, and, you know, at this point, um, pretty much... Um, uh, almost every four-year college, you know, in the United States at least, uh, has access to some of the collections. I mean, I think there's, you know, a, a less than a hundred institutions on and four-year colleges in the United States that don't have access. So, so pretty wide um, uh, coverage uh, in the in the higher education space. How is? Um, well, I have two questions. One is. Um, how is the mission of what you're trying to do the same and, and how is it different than when you started um, 30 years ago? Yeah, I think that, you know, amazingly over 30 years, I think the mission is the same. Uh, how do we how do we help more people get access to to education and knowledge and how do we how do we do that all over the world? And I think um, the the way that we've 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 tried to do that through JSTOR the way that we're we're working hard on that at, at Ithaca SNR, the way we're preserving content in, in uh, Portico, they're all very much lined up to that to that goal and that mission. And you know, I think the work that we it's it's amazing. I think the work that we're doing now feels so much like the work that we were doing in the in the late '90s in in a different way. So, for example, uh, well, I'll just say that like the most the most motivating and inspiring thing for me is when I, I bump into somebody, you know, at a, it, 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 you know, out out and about in a library, in a in a bar, wherever it is, and it's somebody who went to college in the last fifteen or twenty years, and they ask me what I do, and I say, oh, I was working, I work with JSTOR. Oh my gosh, that made a huge, oh, I, that made a huge difference to me. You know, I, I couldn't have gotten through my thesis without JSTOR. Oh, you know, JSTOR, I I I used it all the time in high school or whatever. That never gets old. Like that that concept that we've actually helped somebody get through something or learn something. And so that's that's highly motivating for 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 me, for all of us. And right now, for example, the combination of Ithaca S R and JSTOR, we're working very hard to make JSTOR available in for incarcerated students. And uh, Ithaca S R has worked uh, developing um, programs for higher education in prison, trying to support colleges, providing instruction in prison, and have developed relationships with, um, you know, departments of corrections and, 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 and people involved in the whole infrastructure around, uh, you know, prisons in the United States. And, you know, we're combining that now with, with JSTOR and trying to make it possible for 
uh, the incarcerated students to get access to JSTOR, which is which sounds relatively simple, but is anything but simple um, given the, the the challenges there. And you know, once again, I'm just kind of thinking like, oh, if in five years' time I, I bump into somebody who happened to be incarcerated, who would say to me, oh, that made a huge difference for me. You know, when I was when I was in prison to have access to JSTOR. You know, that that's so the, the motivation is exactly the same, even as we have. Ithaca SNR and JSTOR working together, it's, you know, to try to get to that same, that same place to make a person, you know, make a difference in, in a person's learning life and, um, and try to help them to get, you know, quality information, quality knowledge, quality scholarship in their hands to, to learn and do, do, do good work. So, you know, I think, I think it's, uh, in, in many ways, I could tell you at great length how, how we're really still working in the same, the same important areas. Do you guys think of yourselves as open infrastructure? Yeah, you know, the question of whether we're open is a great is a great question. Obviously, because we're a subscription resource, we're not open access, right? So we've never been associated with open access. I think we've uh, it's it's been frustrating for me because at some level, um, but I understand it. I'm not I'm not uh, discouraged by it in any way. Um, uh, but you know. People want content to be without a paywall and to be openly available. And the challenge is obviously how do you fund that? How do you build on that? How do you invest in in the resource so it keeps having impact? Um, I I think of this. I've always thought of this is that um, you know you if you think of a continuum with one end of the continuum being a subscription product and the other end of the continuum being a completely open product, the open product has got to figure out ways to generate resources over time. And, you know, in, in some form or fashion, it will move toward the middle. It will have some things that it, it figures out how to get resources for. And that could be contributions or it could be services or it could be other things. But it's going to have to develop some way economically to cover its costs. And, you know, we at JSTOR, we had a paywall, quote unquote, subscription uh, resource. So we were kind of over here at this other extreme. And so we we work to make ourselves more open and more open and more open. And I think, you know, the more content and the more capabilities, the more infrastructure we can make open over time, we're going to meet in the middle with, with folks that started out completely open because the bottom line is sustainability depends upon a, a recurring revenue stream. So uh, how you develop that recurring revenue stream can be a hundred different ways. And if you can develop that recurring revenue stream in a way that does not require a subscription, as a not-for-profit organization, that's better. I mean, that's 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 better. But it's it's not by itself, at least in in my experience, possible to just say, well, that's how we're going to do it. So, so we've been moving over time to to make more and more of our um, uh, of what we do open. So we have a, a fair amount of open content, and that's growing all the time. Um, the other thing that we're really trying to do is is to say, okay. Uh, we, we've had all these libraries, all these publishers, all these enterprises invest in us. And we've developed an infrastructure around that, right? We've developed an infrastructure to make access to this content available to millions of people around the planet, all over the globe, like licensees everywhere. Um, that's that's a, an asset. That's an infrastructure. That's an asset. And in addition, the fact that people are aware of JSTOR, they've had a good experience with JSTOR, they've used it, that also is an asset. Now, we could think about those things in a commercial sense and say, well, what are we going to do with that asset? But I, I actually think of it as, as an obligation in the sense that if we're a not-for-profit, we built that infrastructure, now what? I mean, it's fine to have that infrastructure and keep doing what we're doing, but what are we going to do now on top of that? How are we going to add more value or how are we going to add more impact? So one of the ways is by making more and more of the content open. But another of the ways is kind of taking a page out of, a, you know, Amazon's book a little bit where, you know, Amazon Web Services was take the infrastructure you've built and make it useful, make a service out of it. And so one of the things that we're really trying to do is to figure out ways to take our infrastructure and make that available. So, so we have a program called Open Community Collections now where libraries can upload the content onto the platform. And the idea is that content sits alongside the JSTOR content, which has value. Um, but we can make that content openly available to the world if the libraries want to do that. And, and we can use our infrastructure to help support the community. So, so we're working to try to make um, 
our infrastructure more open. We're trying to make our content more open, but we can't just flick the switch and do that for everything and all we do at, at, a, at, a, at a moment. Um, uh, hopefully over time, people will, who are, who are uh, more committed to open will see the movement we're making. We, we've been doing that all along. I mean, I think, you know, in the form of, as I said earlier, things like the DNAI initiative where, you know, institutions all over the world have been getting free access to JSTOR for a long time. And that's obviously subsidized and enabled by the institutions that are paying a subscription. And it's not enough in some respects because we should open it to everyone as much as we can, but it's it's a way for us to do that sustainably and, and keep growing and evolving over time. So that's a that's a broad overview of how we're trying to build infrastructure that can support the open uh, open principles. So you and I are talking today because um, we're announcing uh, an investment from uh, by Ithaca into Anno, um, our public benefit uh, corporation. And um, you and I have been talking about this now for almost three years. Um, and I'm curious, um, why did you guys decide to make uh, this investment? Well, I think I think that first it's been it's been great to get to know you, and we have a, a lot of faith in your leadership of 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 the enterprise, and also just the commitment you've made to open infrastructure over a number of years. And um, you know, I think we first did some collaborative work with with Hypothesis as much as I don't know seven or eight years ago, and you and I've gotten to know each other over over several years, three or three years at least. And, you know, just realizing at a first level that annotation just seems like an important part of education. It's kind of unrealized and that eventually annotation has got to be a part of the learning process, right? I mean, just the notion of a faculty member uh, teaching students, giving them the opportunity to asynchronously engage with a, a, a written document and, and have a discussion online. I mean, that just, it seems inevitable to me that that's, that's necessary. And the approach that, that, um, that Hypothesis has taken and Anno is taking with an open, interoperable infrastructure for that, that all different resources can use is definitely the way to go as opposed to some proprietary approach to try to create, you know, loyalty or stickiness on one, you know, one company's platform. So, so I think we were, we were taken both by the, the idea of, of annotation being an important part of education and also by the approach that you've taken and the leadership you've provided to, to work very hard to do that in an open way. And, you know, it's taken years, some years for you to get, you know, traction on that. And, uh, you know, our hope is that, 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 that time for impact is here and that you are well, well timed for that to have the impact that, that you want to have. So, you know, I think from a standpoint of just investing in the community and what I was saying before about moving toward open, it, it seemed appropriate for us to try to accelerate or help um, with, with something we thought was an important tool and important component of open infrastructure uh, that we could support that. Now, at the same time, it will be very good for JSTOR users, right? If we can uh, work with you collaboratively to develop uh, the capability and you know, really easily and really conveniently for people to do annotation over JSTOR articles and other content that we're adding to the platform. So there's a, there's a direct um, uh, benefit for, for our user community if we, can, if we can work effectively together. So, so the idea that we could also uh, both support through an investment, uh, the broad principles and mission of the organization, and at the same time work together with you to actually improve the product and service that people get, both when they work with JSTOR, whether they're using JSTOR, and when they have an opportunity to use Hypothesis, whether that's on our platform or you know, other, other providers, uh, that seems like just a you know, wonderful win-win, if you will, on both sides and you know, great for uh, for the community generally. So we're supporting open, we're supporting JSTOR, we're supporting Hypothesis, and most importantly, we're supporting the users that we think um, annotation can really uh, help uh, improve their learning and improve the teaching. So, uh, so you know, we're super excited about about it and, you know, really happy that, that you know, after this time, we've been able to figure out a way to work together. So, so we're, we're very excited. That's true. Um, um, so my understanding is that this is actually the 
first time that uh, that Ithaca has made this kind of an investment in another organization. Um, and um, how how did it uh, how did it come about that um, that you guys decided to to go in this direction? Yeah, so I think I think the 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 question of making investments in um, in other organizations, I think it's really fundamentally about accelerating the mission. Like how are there's there may be some things that we can do well ourselves, uh, but there may be some things that we're just not well positioned to do ourselves or we can't do it fast enough. And if we really want to serve our community, there are better ways for us to invest the resources that we have or spend the money that we have. Uh, so, for example, I mean, we we believe that that annotation is a really important uh, potential tool and we think it's inevitable. We could, you know, have our product teams develop an annotation layer, you know, or service. Um, this just seems a, such a better way to, to go about doing that. Um, and as I said before, to, to invest in open at the same time makes a lot of sense. So we're, we're thinking about um, how do we make the best use of our resources? And while, you know, there'll be you know, we're not a you know we're not a company that an organization that's going to have huge investments in other companies or you know acquiring a bunch of companies or anything like that. But I think we are going to look to ways that we can um, uh, advance our mission and and serve our community. And if we can do that faster and better, uh, we'll do that. Now there are a couple examples that were not investments, but that also fit this. One is Reveal Digital, uh, which we we brought into the organization several years ago. Um, and another is Art Store, which we merged with with J Store uh, five or six years ago. These are these are opportunities for us to, um, you know, in the case of of, of Reveal Digital, uh, to bring primary source content that libraries care about, and having made open onto the J Store uh, infrastructure, as I was saying earlier, and in Art Store's case, bringing images onto the platform and and working to integrate the image and text experience for, for scholars and students. So, so we look for those opportunities and this was one where, you know, we, we feel like we can, we can, um, we can have an impact and accelerate our impact, uh, in the community by an investment, uh, not a, you know, an acquisition or something like that. So, uh, you know, a great opportunity for us to bring together the, um, as I say before, the, the investment in open and also the, the impact for our users. I guess if you um, were going to look out a little bit and think about what's possible together, um, what are some of the things that um, that you think about or that kind of um, excite you the most? Yeah, I'm really excited to work with with uh, Hypothesis and Anno uh, to bring you know JSTOR even more into the teaching and learning experience. Um, you know, to have faculty. Uh, engaged in real time in when they assign articles to to students having that kind of uh careful reading being done through a social platform an annotation platform um, i think that working with with hypothesis will also bring us more closely engaged with the the learning management systems of you know from a variety of different providers that 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 bring jstor just a, a step even closer into the teaching and learning environment. I think we're, we're there now, but I think there are ways that we could be better integrated and, and more useful and more impactful in that way. So I think, you know, that's one thing that's that's uh, that's very appealing to us. And, and, you know, as that door opens, I think there are lots of other opportunities for the way that, um, the ways that, that JSTOR can be useful, uh, not only the, the journal archives that we talked about earlier, but, the, the many, you know, tens of thousands of books that are on the platform and the increasing huge amount of, of, of primary source content on the platform. So I think that, you know, bringing first the annotation, but, you know, we're, we're confident that Hypothesis and, and Anno are going to move beyond just annotation into other areas of teaching and learning, and, and we'd love to be along, along for, that, uh, for that, that journey. So I think it's just the start of, of more engagement in the teaching and learning space for, for us. What um, what are some questions you might have for me? Well, it's uh, you know I, I think I think some of some of the questions that I would have are, are, are kind of mirror yours. I mean I think um, you know you all uh, have 
grown over a number of years, gained traction over a number of years. As you looked out in the community, there, there are a variety of places that you could prioritize for, uh, for first collaboration, but also in looking for resources. What, what, what drew you to, to JSTOR and to Ithaca and, and, and how, how is it that, you know, we became, we're, we're, I mean, at least you've, you've worked with a lot of different providers, but in terms of this kind of investment, um, you know, we're, we're a partner that's, um, you know, it's obviously actively engaged in an operational uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, was that something you were look, looking for? What, what are some of the, the, the decision um, factors that you had in, in, in choosing us or working with us? Yeah, well, at first I would say it wasn't like there were 10, you know, options in which we went through a search process or something. JSTOR and, and Ithaca are actually an incredibly unique um, and kind of singular resource out there in the combination of this impact focus, nonprofit structure, extraordinary reach, I mean, 13,000 you know, institutions around the world, the sheer volume of content that you guys have got across so many different fields, art store, and so for us, I think it was just um, um, that that's a, um, you know, to be able to bring this kind of um, collaborative capability, both in classrooms, but just generally for researchers, research communities, scholarly communities, um, and to do it with a partner that um, represents, you know, such a huge part of the gravitational, you know, force of those communities um, is pretty unique. Um, and we're just, you know, we're super excited about that. Um, so I would say we're, we're interested, we're interested in the classroom aspects, which are, we're very, very focused on right now. We're also looking to see how we can bring um, infrastructure for kind of scholarly communities um, uh, forward so that they can use, um, have discussions that are, you know, in, in our smaller community groups um, over uh, the literature. Um, art store is just super exciting for us as a place to think about how to do some really cool um, kinds of annotation, social annotation, and even individual annotation um, capabilities um, to really, you know, kind of take that resource and bring it to an even, you know, greater um, level and just in terms of what people can do with it. Um, so for, I think, um, uh, there's just so many different things. I think for us, the challenge is going to be kind of focusing first and really choosing the things that, that are the most important to work on next. And, you know, as a collaboration with you guys. And the other thing I would just say is you, you're the people at Ithaca, um, the team members, you know, that we've been working with, uh, Alex Humphreys, I mean, for years now are just, um, really high quality thinkers that are passionate about this space. And it's, you know, just a, a joy to be, to have that privilege of working a little closer with you guys. No, I appreciate that. You know, I, I think about, you asked me the question about, you know, some of our history and, um, and obviously the, the context of open and you, you've been in that space for a long time. And, um, you know, you've, you've gone through a, a journey, uh, of, you know, sort of as, as every sort of startup does, uh, sort of evolving, changing, adapting to, you know, a changing environment. Can you kind of take me through a little bit of that history in terms of, you know, hypothesis, early genesis and what you originally thought it was going to be, how that evolved, uh, how that evolves in the landscape that we're in now? Like how, how yeah. tell, take us along on that, that journey a little bit. Um, see if I can shorthand it. Um, I think initially the the idea and this kind of I was doing work in the climate space and you know there's a you know there's, you know different perspectives on what's the truth and you know uh, you know what what kind of information should we pay attention to and fundamentally how do we as a society come to consensus um, about things that are important. Uh, we may disagree on our perspectives, but we do agree that they're at least important topics. Um, and I, you know, I had this idea that um, that instead of trying to create an alternative information source, that being able to have, be able to bring perspectives or surface perspectives over the content that already exists, um, that is perhaps sometimes contentious, um, was powerful. 
and I discovered that it turns out that was a really old idea that a lot of people had had um, for a long time before um, uh, before me for sure. Um, and so I, I discovered started to discover these different projects and uh, and more and more of them. And finally, I was like, okay, well, we still don't have it. Uh, all these people have been trying what's happened and started to interview uh, people that had been involved in some of these early projects. And a, and a kind of a story began to emerge about the importance of standards um, and um, open infrastructure, open approaches, um, open source software, it, very much the same in, in the same way that before the web, we had these online service providers like CompuServe and, and you know, uh, AOL and, and whatnot. And they were all their own little kingdoms. Um, you know, you were either over here or you were over here. Um, uh, maybe you could send an email to each other, but you couldn't, there was no shared space. And then the web came along and changed all of that because of some fundamental properties about openness and standards and so forth and open source implementations of these things called browsers um, that, were, that, that were the first examples of those. And um, so for us, when, we, when I started thinking, okay, well, how do you have a shared conversation and started interviewing these previous projects, it became very clear that if we didn't borrow the principles and the learnings of the, of the web in trying to solve this problem, that we you know, were not likely to be successful in the way that so many of these other projects had kind of gone by the wayside. Um, so it initially kind of started off as kind of a, you know, almost like a fact checking, you know, um, frame. But as we started to proceed, write software and to start to tap into these communities that have been thinking about this problem for a long time, um, we're invited into the W3C process um, to form a working group. It became crystal clear that the opportunity is, you know, fact checking is a teeny little sliver of it, just an enormous collaborative opportunity um, over knowledge, over all knowledge, and um, something that could be with you um, ever, you know, always as a native feature of browsers or even a proprietary thing like the Kindle. You know, why can't you have a book club over the book you just bought? Well, you know, if we're, if we're effective at solving this problem, um, you will be able to uh, because eventually um, this paradigm will. So for us, it was um, um, just really realizing the magnitude of the opportunity that was in front of us and then beginning to pursue it. Um, initially, Josh Greenberg at Sloan reached out and said, hey, what you're doing is would be perfect for some of the problems that we're trying to solve and open peer review and um then Don Waters at Mellon said, "Hey, you know, we've been looking at uh, some of this annotation stuff and um, and funding projects like this." So we got introduced to the scholarly communities, and a lot of things started to resonate. Um, that the that starting with these communities in scholarship, science, and in learning, where so much of the knowledge production. Um, and content production of the world happens, you know, annually. I think mean, 11 of the top 15 publishers by revenue on earth are either educational or research publishers. Um, and so you start to appreciate um, that this is an extraordinarily, if you're going to try to bring something to the world and content is your strategic real estate, that starting here is a really powerful place to get started, to get traction um, and to, and to develop the, um, the paradigm um, and its utility um, and then to take it from here out to the broader world. Um, and we also think it's really powerful to start on learning and, and knowledge oriented utility cases for this um, as opposed to, you know, necessarily inter entertainment type, more classically social um, use cases, which are fine. Um, but they, um, you know, we think we'll get closer to the impact that we're trying to have by starting with these communities. So, you had a you had a a, a startup uh, originally, and you had a you know what they like to call a successful exit uh, previously. So, what what drew you to this like a more, more mission driven effort? And and how, when you you know were first getting you you mentioned several you know Don Waters from Mellon and. 
and Josh from Sloan, you know, you were chasing uh, grant funding at a not-for-profit as opposed to investment capital. Um, what, what, what took you down that path? And then now you're thinking about uh, doing this with Anno and having, uh, you know, an investment uh, 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 company around it to help make it happen. So tell us how you got started and why, why Anno at this point. Yeah, um, great question. Uh, so uh, my first company was a travel travel startup, the first uh, web-based capability to book travel reservation over the web. Um, and, you know, we grew that uh, from a couple people to almost 600 and over six years and went public. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, I was very young. You know, I started when I was 25 years old. And this was a, you know, it was a, an extraordinary personally, you know, kind of empowering experience to be able to create something like that and go through all these different stages. And, um, you know, and then we, you know, the company got sold and, you know, we had that successful exit. Um, but I, it left me, um, uh, you know, um, you know, is it, uh, in a way wanting much more just personally from the, that journey. And, to have the next journey be much more about bringing, I mean, it's great that people can book their travel online now, but it's really fundamentally changed the world um, in a profound way for the better. No, it's been a kind of a, you know, a feature. Um, and so I was um, trying to say, you know, I think the great thing about going through that journey was a realization that I, as a, as a very young person, you know, could, decide to do something and actually have it come happen and to, to, you know, create, you know, a large organization with a bunch of people and that were in support of a mission and achieved it. And so it, this kind of switch uh, flipped in my brain. Um, and I said, you know, if that's true, then the most important thing, if I'm going to do something else is the choice about what to do. Um, and if I want to, you know, if I want to try to make an impact, then what am I going to choose? Um, and so I think for me, um, you know, the, the experience with different perspectives and information, <laughs> what's, what's maybe happening or not in, in the climate space, I said, well, there, there might be no larger apex problem than trying to find infrastructure to build, you know, social consensus um, and to bring people a little bit closer in their perspectives as they, you know, transit the world around them. Um, and over, you know, kind of pulling on a piece of yarn over a little while, you know, kind of led, uh, um, led here. You know, the, the choice of nonprofit initially was just a simple one. It was a bunch of for-profit ad-driven companies had tried to um, start and solve this annotation problem with basically ad-driven widgets um, that were built on proprietary stacks. And interviews with those founders led me to the conclusion that if you wanted to get the entire world to adopt a universal conversation framework over everything, and you wanted to do it as a proprietary thing, it just wasn't going to work um, because you would have too much friction. Um, people would be like, well, Okay, but you know, you guys are going to be the, you know, rulers of all conversations everywhere, and using a black box system, it's just not going to happen. Um, so, um, so it was, you know, the, you know, borrowing from the web, web shamelessly from from Tim Berners Lee and from everybody else that came before, it was like, okay, we don't have to do that. Let's create a, a standard um, by which. Anybody can um, build this scaffolding by which together we can all build the scaffolding um, for conversations using, you know, open APIs and, and anybody can build uh, a, a, a conversation client or a server uh, and they can interoperate together. Um, and that felt like a much more satisfying answer. Um, and so initially we did that as a nonprofit because um, we just felt like it was too hard to solve. There was a bit of a buildup with standards and everything. We just didn't feel like we could get venture 
folks to fund that early work, that it was too much of a uncertain, you know, kind of time period required and too much, uh, you know, needing to bring stakeholders together. Uh, we funded this for a number of years um, on grants, uh, increasing grants from Mellon and Sloan and whatnot. And about 2017, there started to become a shift um, where the grants were harder to get. We weren't the shiny new penny anymore. Um, we were entering this kind of mezzanine phase of our existence when it's classically harder to get that kind of uh, support. And, um, and a lot of the grants pro programs were starting to dry up a little bit or their scholarly calm tech um, category was going away. Helmsley shut theirs down. Arnold shut theirs down. Um, kind of Josh at Sloan kind of went dark there for about uh, a year. Um, Don Waters retired at Mellon and there was a little bit, bit of a, you know, a little bit of a shift. Um, and all of a sudden we were looking at trying to grow and step into the opportunity, declining sources of funding um, and a, a greater need. And we just said how, you know, and so we came together on a project called Invest in Open Infrastructure, um, which um, th that came out of a conference where we realized a bunch of these open tech projects like ourselves were having exactly the same challenges. And we said, well, how can we solve this, these challenges together? So we, we came together in, um, and formed IOI, Invest in Open, um, and began a process to kind of solve this and, and uh, recruited Kay Thaney from uh, Mozilla to come in and who's now the executive director of IOI. And at the same time we were doing all this, which we felt like was important work, we realized the time frame is just too short. Like this is going to pay off maybe in five or 10 years um, with better funding for infrastructure, but we need a solution now. Um, and so we said, what's a good hybrid approach here? Um, and uh, we, we realized, looked into benefit corporation, B Corps, and realized that there was a path here um, to um, start a parallel organization that we could bring investment into um, while still preserving the mission and would help us align better with the kind of investors like Ithaca um, that had the resources to be able to support what we wanted to do um, and um, but but really needed and appreciated that impact focus, um, and so um, we made the decision and and uh, incorporated, and here we are. Yeah, I think it highlights one of the the big challenges for for not for profits in general, right? Is is the capital? Um, how do you raise capital as a not for profit? It's, it's very challenging, and and as you pointed out, you can generate some capital from foundations, but Generally speaking, they're they're spreading their resources out over a lot of different ins institutions and and programs, and and they don't tend to stay in there over time with the level of capital that's required to get to get services started. So it's been a challenge for not for profit based services as long as I've been working in the space, and um, it you know it's 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 uh, it's very difficult. It's why you you sometimes see you know that that sort of sequence of entities working on a problem you know rotating through so um so i think it's a it's a it's a very um uh creative and and thoughtful way uh you're you're taking to to both create the capital generate the capital to be able to make the investments to make a nonprofit service work and um and i think it's i think it's super important to 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 be able to have that it's just hard to get these things started uh without about those kind of early resources, and you've you've hung in there for quite some time, um, uh, you know, on a combination of, of grants and, and other funds. I'm sure you found from, from from your own personal finances and other things. But yeah. it's it's it just takes time to get these things things going for the indeed. world to, to find. Yeah. that's half the battle is just uh, pushing long enough and surviving long enough um, um, to get. Uh, to get the the win, um, you know, the stuff is infrastructure is not easy. Timing is everything in the sense of like yeah. you know, there's got to be there's got to be good weather. Yeah. Um, well, um, I thank you so much for uh, taking some time and uh, sharing your thoughts. Thank you. It's it's fun. It's fun to uh, to talk about you know where we're going to go together and uh, and it really you know 
totally looking forward to it and, and really appreciate appreciate the work that you're doing and look forward to, to, to working with you to serve, you know, serve scholars and students and teachers.